a great privilege for me to perform the introductory rituals for this lecture. Uh, let me begin with just a few words about the person who we are honoring today. Dwarkanath Sadashiv Bodkar, or Nath as he was known to friends, was born in 1911 in Bombay. D.S. Borkar was India's first delegate to the World Congress of Physical Education held in Stockholm in November 1939. As a civil servant, he worked in the Planning Commission as well as public sector enterprises such as Hindustan Steel, the State Trading Corporation, Fertilizers Corporations, and Engineers India Limited. Year after year, the Borkar Memorial Lecture Series harvests a range of opinions from our most eminent thinkers and public figures on how India would be in 2047. This is part forecast and part wish fulfillment. It's my pleasure now to invite Sainath, who of course needs no introduction. Thank you. I suspect that like several speakers in this series of lectures before me, I begin by whining about how alarming the word vision is. I certainly am scared of words like vision and for that matter, I'm very scared of words like dignitary so has. But, okay, however, the thing, the reason why it scares me, um, I don't know, it sounds very lofty and big and I can't, and also that I can't begin to remember how many people who have had visions have ceased to be my friends? <laughs> and my own crude personal reaction to anyone sharing issues of vision with me is to suggest a visit to the ophthalmologist or shrink, you know, who are competent to deal with that. Maybe the word I will use because 2047 is not all that far off. Okay? Maybe the word I'll use is hope or vision interchangeably, both. And I think what we can hope to see or envision for 2047, it could depend a lot on what we do in 2017. So in order to have, in order to have a, a vision or hope of what should be, we need to have a completely unromanticized view of what is. A completely unromanticized view of where we are and what is. Then you can think about what should be and how we go about that. So, well, 2047 and 2017, that's one set of dates. I'll take you back to an extremely important date for someone like me, and I concur with their vision that led to 1947. So I think that the vision that led to 1947 remains only partially realized, not fulfilled, and extremely important. One of the things I do as a journalist and have done for nearly 20 years now, is that I have been recording interviews with the last living freedom fighters. It is such a moving experience. It is such a, two weeks ago, I was at the village of Nana Patil, the first man to declare a provisional underground government under the British in Maharashtra. Nana Patil, 120, 150 villages swore allegiance in Sangli and Satara to the Patri, Patri Sarkar. They used to nail their notices to the trees and the boards. Nana Patil was the leader of that uprising and I went there for a function to commemorate, to, to commemorate his, uh, his anniversary. And uh, when I was there, I realized apart from the mass of young students who crowded the hall, that there was six, seven people, very aged gentlemen sitting separately in one corner and they turned out to be freedom fighters in their 90s who are still alive. Mahadev Mane, 
a whole heap of them. You know who these people were? There was also Bapu Lad a few villages away. All of them were part of what was known as the Tufan Sena, the whirlwind army that believed in direct action and took on British imperialism head on in an uprising that saw the farmers of Satara and Sangli and the Western Maharashtra attack the trains. It's very hard looking at Bapu Lad today, the 95 year old Bapu Lad, to imagine that he mounted a horse and stopped the Mumbai Karad, uh, Bombay Karad Express and looted the payroll meant for the British Sarkari officials and this money was distributed to the starving peasantry and, agri and uh, farm laborers in a period of drought and famine. In fact, years ago, when I met Bapu Lad, I received a prize in his name and asked him about the attack on the train. He said, humne kuch loot nahi kiya. Jo angrezi ne loot, loot, loot ke gaya, humne wapas laya. Yeah. Now, I have, I interviewed Salihan in Odisha, the Adivasi woman who with 40 other women took on the troops in what came to be known as the uprise, the Salihan uprising in Nawapada. Okay. Uh, I have interviewed um, the, some of the oldest Babas, the Gadri Babas in the early 90s who were still alive at the time. Okay. The last of them. What some, there was something common to all of them and all of them had a vision. Maybe their vision was different from one another also, but they had certain common things to their vision. What did you fight for? Of course, everyone said we fought to expel the alien ruler. You pressed the question, what did you fight for really? They fought for a just society. They fought for a nation based on justice. This is common across the freedom fighters. They fought for a just society. They fought for a good society. And yeah, they had a vision. And it was a vision very strongly tied to justice. And it is so important as Sukumar mentioned that your preamble puts justice so, so clearly at the top of what we have to do. Uh, so what do we have now? As I said, we need to know, have an unromanticized view of what we have today if we want to know what should be. The levels of inequality we generated mean today, if you look, there are four, five sets of data that you can look at. You can look at the NSS decile wise wealth holding in India. I mean, to total household wealth. You can look at the Forbes billionaires data. You can look at the uh, Oxfam's analysis of Credit Suisse's World Wealth Report. You can look at Credit Suisse's World Wealth Report itself. And to save you the time, India figures on page 149. So you can look at the data given there. What does it show you that we have succeeded in doing? Between 2000, year 2000 and 2015, in those 16 years, India achieved this distinction of having the fastest growth of inequality of any major nation. There are nations more unequal than us, more, far more unequal than us, like South Africa. But the rate at which it grew, the rate at which that growth took place of inequality in the large nations. And we've also built uh, new inequalities, reinforcing the old. There are many old inequalities like caste and untouchability and stuff. And we have built on those, we've deepened those, we have generated them further. I want to tell you that, you know, because we are so cut off from our own society, because our media cocooners from any, they're suddenly taken unawares and really don't know what to do when something like Una happens. Una is not, you know, what is Una? It was a spectacular breakdown of a process that has been on and on and on for a very long time. It wasn't a one-off incident. It wasn't that this atrocity took place here. It was a breakdown of a 
absolutely unsustainable process of exploitation of unequal inequality. And by the way, the, the untouchability in, I would like to emphasize, is not as people try reducing it to just a social evil. Untouchability is far more than a social evil. Untouchability is a highly sophisticated and effective strategy of ensuring ourselves a permanent and perpetual pool of cheap demoralized labor. And that is what untouchability is about beyond just being a social evil. Okay? It is a highly sophisticated strategy of ensuring a permanent and perpetual pool of cheap and demoralized labor. Of course, today, what, what do we have? We have Swatch Bharat. <laughs> yeah. Based on septic tanks. Do you know that this year, I'm so glad that the Max SA Prize honored, or rather, Bezwada Wilson honored the Max SA Prize. Okay. <laughs> if, you ask, if you ask Wilson, he will tell you, as he spoke, at, on April 13th, the day before Ambedkar's anniversary in Delhi at Jantar Mantar, he explained that in fact, the one of the 1,357 Safai Karamchari deaths that have occurred in the last several years, the vast majority have occurred in septic tanks. Okay, the vast, including last. Uh, last week, I was speaking at Hyderabad, four of them died in a manhole. But the vast majority of the Safai Karamcharis, look at this, the most shameful practice of any country on earth. Okay? But the vast majority died in septic tanks, and you are having this gigantic project called Swach Bharat built on septic tanks, with, where it's a major part of your strategy. So this was Be Bezawada Wilson speaking at the Bhim Yatra, where Safai Karamcharis came from scores of districts across the country and they went on a tour which saw them in teams, relaying teams, crossing hundreds of districts in a country of 688 districts. They came to Delhi to find no media reception at all. They got covered by the media. You know why? Because the NIIT students of Srinagar were also sitting there and the television had come to cover them and then they also spoke. So, you know, so that's how they got some coverage. I was making a calculation there. There are two versions of how many Safai Karamcharis, manual scavengers. It's an odd word to use manual for a profession and occupation that I think suspect is 80% run by women. But uh, the manual scavengers are estimated to be 2 lakh by government and 3 lakh by Wilson and his group and his movement. And according to the government, it costs about three lakhs per scavenger to rehabilitate that person. Take them out of an old profession, give them a new out old occupation and give them a new profession. It costs three lakhs. So let's take the high end figure. Three lakhs and each three lakhs. That's 9,000 crore. That's about what Vijay Malia owes the banks. And he, he offered to, re remember, he offered to return half. So we could have a PPP with him and, you know, <laughs> or a joint venture and eradicate half of the manual scavenging. Right, I mean, I don't see why people are so negative about the idea about these PPPs and <laughs> you. Uh, so you had, you have, Approaching 2017, a quarter of a million human beings cleaning human excreta with their hands. What sort of nation are you? What sort of society are we? Here's my vision. I want an India willing to look in the mirror and see ourselves for the caste-ridden, discriminatory, and unjust society we are. I want that. And I don't want to wait for 2047. I want it today.
in, you know, you can't have, we have socialized ourselves not to see this going on around us. We can't have a vision of the future. You can't have vision if we cling willingly to myopia. It's not possible. The two are contradictory. It, after 70 years, Dalits, not just the manual scavengers, but 200 million of them, are still forbidden in most villages in this country from using the common graveyards, pathways, temples, tea shops, common, common grounds, common properties, arbitrariness. Arbitrariness is the name of the game. And it's again a way of holding people down. I just, I've just come to hate these words social evil. That's, a, that's a, a part of it. It's not the whole of it. Or you take, you, the arbitrariness is just deadly. You know, in my innocence about 20 years ago when I was looking at the Kumher massacre in Rajasthan, Chunni Lal Jatav, a Dalit, one of the survivors of the massacre, kept telling me things which I thought were not, you know, not possible. I said, Chunni Lalji, this is not the procedure. It couldn't have happened this way. Chunni Lalji, the police could not have done that because that is not the police procedure. Chunni Lalji, the police could not have written that because it has to go into that other diary. He was very patient with my complete ignorance. After listening to me, he sweetly said, Saina ji, talk to me about law and justice and procedure, sure. He said, all the learned just judges of the Supreme Court do not have the power of my local Havaldar. The learned judges interpret the law. My Havaldar writes his own. And it's true. The learned judges interpret the law that Havaldar makes up his own as he goes along. Arbitrariness that Chunilal Jatav spoke of in Kumher, you can see today in the extension of the beef ban in Maharashtra. And you can look at its results, you can look at its consequences, which are just so devastating. What did they do? They wanted to shaft the Muslims. That's all they wanted, right? But then you've got a bunch of people so completely stupid that even what they want to achieve, they, they achieve far beyond it, okay? Oh yeah, by extending the beef ban to bullocks and uh, bulls and whatever, they did devastate a significant Muslim community in Maharashtra. They also finished all the other major communities in the agrarian sector. The cattle market prices in Maharashtra have fallen 60%. When you're an IAS probationer at Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy, one of the first things you're taught when you go out as a probationer to your district is, if cattle market prices fall 30%, you have a crisis. It's fallen 60%, okay? It's fallen 60% because no one now can buy or sell. No one now can buy or sell, and people are terrified. So, by the way, who are the cattle market dealers? As you know, every five, ten villages has a market. Many of the dealers are your other backward castes, OBCs. Many of the dealers. There are Muslim OBCs, there are Hindu OBCs. They are the dealers. Then, the Maratha farmer is devastated by that. In the drought in Marathwada, what happens? You can't feed your family. You can't get water for your family. How are you going to provide water for your half a dozen cows? How are you going to provide food for your half a dozen cows? So farmers watched their cows die. Okay? The Gaur Rakshaks killed these cows. Farmers watched their cows. So the Maratha farmers took a beating. And of course, ultimately, as always, the Dalits took a complete beating because your Kolhapur chapel industry took the brunt of that without hides. When they tried bringing hides from Krompet in Chennai, 
just on the edge of Chennai, which is my hometown, Chennai. Uh, those vans were set alight by activists of the Bajrang Dal, VHP, on the borders of Karnataka, Maharashtra. So the Kolhapur industry, so you had the Marathas, the Dalits, the Muslims, the OBCs, everybody suffering. But I want to tell you something else about cows generally. None of these clowns meddling with that issue has any sense of how important cattle are in the rural economy, how central they are to so many sections of the rural economy. Okay? And I also want to tell you this, in the last 25 years, regardless of which government has been in power, whether it is the NDA or the UPA, livestock population of this country has been in decline, A. The worst decline has been of deshi cows, 9%. Desi breeds are in the, seeing the heaviest decline. Now, the inequalities, as I said, that keep growing. You know, I'm looking for an India where I, where the Dalits will have won by 47 what I believe to be the greatest battle for human dignity on earth today. And at first of the human rights, the right to be recognized as human, the destruction of untouchability, which is one part of the caste problem, but to be able to ascertain their rights and that, that are guaranteed to them under the Constitution, but rarely enforced. 25 years ago, before this great period started, there were no gated communities in India. Okay? Look at, I'm coming back to inequality. There were gated communities of the Desi variety, which is the caste layout of every village in this country, Indian apartheid, where Dalits are never part of the village, they are on the outskirts of the village. Usually on the southern outskirts, ask me why later. 25 years ago, or if you look at 1991, Delhi, there's a generation sitting here that doesn't know that there were no steel gates fencing off all the major colonies of Delhi. There were no steel gates and private cops and private security for Chanakya Puri, RK Puram, Vasant Vihar and a hundred other colonies. None of these gates. I lived in a servant's quarters in uh, Vasant Vihar in the 1980s as well. I was a reporter, a journalist at the United News of India. Okay. Now, First, you privatize public properties, shutting them off at seven and harassing those who come with their cows and buffaloes, etc. You are in fact enclosing many public properties like the electricity, trans the, the transformer, the water supply, everything you've shut in. And now, in, that was by 1993 it began to happen. By 2003, there are gated communities in the Western sense all across India. 2013, there is a corporation called Gated Communities in India. And there is a website, you can go and look at it tonight, gatedcommunities.com, which says we are the fastest growing. We are very proud. We are always the fastest, best, <laughs> shortest, fattest, fittest, whatever. Hmm. The Gated Communities, you should read the notices, how they praise and glorify exclusion. They glorify exclusion. Now this is the class exclusion that you're adding to already existing caste exclusion. And they sit very well together because you'll find that the gated community's exclusion has not in any way troubled the Varnashrama Dharma. It has not upset the caste exclusion. Both are sitting very happily together. Let me tell you, Aquaria Granda, a complex, Grande, the, oh, by the way, you know, now, the exotic names are Spanish. We are, we are done with Portuguese and Italian. So, yeah, so Aquaria Grande is a complex that will have anywhere between 150 and 210 swimming pools. Every balcony has a swimming pool. You can go onto the net and look at it. It's got clearance. It's not been built. All the builders are in a slump. But, and also there was resistance. But all over the country, these kind of structures are coming up. Pune has two, three buildings, 12 floors, swimming pool, every floor. They're called balcony pools. In a state boasting the 
greatest drought in 70 years, 100 years. All these were given permission and clearances. That kind of inequality. And who are the people building the swimming pools? Who are the people building Aquaria Grande? If you're a reporter like me, you go and interview not the builder, but the construction laborer. They are the ones, the construction laborers at these various sites. Kaun ho tu? Sab, hum shetkari hai sir. Shet mazdoor hai sir. Shetkari and shet mazdoor in Marathi is farmer and farm labor. What are you doing here? Why are you not in? Uh, do, uh, why are you not on your farm? Khet mein pani kaha hai sir? Okay. They have abandoned their village because there is no water and come to the city to build our swimming pools. Maharashtra has added, by the way, something like between 20 and 21 golf courses in these 25 years. You know how much water that takes? More water than any other sport and more pesticides than any other sport. Uh, you have on the, Mahara on the Mumbai Pune Highway Hundreds of giant hoardings advertising luxury villas and central to every one of them is the size and shape of the swimming pool. My favorite is one which on the Mumbai Pune highway says luxury villas, swimming pool and attached forest reserve. <laughs> In the state of Maharashtra, the poor tiger doesn't have an attached forest reserve. Okay, but the, the building notes have that. Water has always been special in India's inequalities, exclusiveness and exclusion from the days when we have denied Dalits access to the community well and the community tap. By the way, in Marathwada, oh, you saw the new mentality of the India approaching 2017. How many editorials were written criticizing the High Court for its decision to penalize the Indian Premier League? People actually wrote editorials attacking the, uh, and I speak as an absolute cricket fan and fanatic. I don't think of IPL as cricket, by the way. But <laughs> attacking the high court for its decision to say that you cannot hold these matches here when people are dying without water. No one ever mentioned that in Marathwada, where poor women were paying between 45 paisa to one rupee for a liter of water, 24 beer factories exist in Marathwada getting water at four paisa per liter. Beer and alcohol factories. I'm not counting the hundreds of bottling plants for water. I'm not talking about the mineral water mafia. These are the new inequalities. Look at what your constitution promised. Look at what your freedom struggle promised. Look at the kind of promises that we gave ourselves, the contract we made with the Indian people, with the Indian nation about inequality and equality and justice and fairness. Mm -hmm.